Hi guys, Pete the Wargamer here, back with another Flames of War painting tutorial. In this video, I'll be using some paints from the Vallejo range to tackle some British infantry in a late war European scheme. So, as with all painting, before we actually start using any paintbrushes, we first of all need to apply primer so that the later layers of paint adhere to the miniature surface. It doesn't matter too much which colour you go for, but I've opted to use a mixture of Vallejo's grey and black airbrush primers to help paint the various mid-tones of the miniature. you also note that I'm painting my infantry in a batch of five models, which will be grouped together onto a single base. To make holding the small miniatures easier, I have attached them to a lollipop stick with a small bit of superglue. The first area that I'll be painting are the fatigues, and for this, we'll be starting off with a base coat of, unsurprisingly, English uniform. As with all of the base coats that I'll be painting in this video, you'll want to mix this paint with some water in roughly equal quantities to make the paint easy to work with. Apply your first layer, then allow the paint to dry before applying a second over the top. This layering technique will give a much smoother finish whilst avoiding the possibility of obscuring details by applying the paint too thickly. Using the same thinning and base coating method as before, we next want to paint the green areas of the model. We'll be painting the blind code areas of the model, like the webbing, gaiters and pouches, as well as painting the helmet. To tackle all of these areas, I'll be using some Russian uniform. To paint some of the scrim of the helmet, carefully paint some of those small strips of cloth using khaki. For the wooden furniture of the rifle and any other wooden areas on your model, I'll be base coating all of them using flat earth. Next, we want to tackle both the bare skin of our infantry, which include the face and the hands. These areas are quite small, so take your time and use an appropriately sized brush. To create the appearance of black and steel and to paint the black leather of the boots, we want to start off by painting all these areas using the very dark grey of German grey. By using a grey paint here rather than a pure black, we'll be able to take advantage of a dark wash in the next couple of steps. With all of the base coats completed, we can now start to apply some washes. These are great for boosting the visibility of details as they will flow into the recessed areas and create the appearance of shadows. The first wash we'll be applying in this way is sepia wash, but straight out of the pot, it'll be a little too strong. So we first need to water it down a little. Mix water into your wash until you have a consistency similar to what you see here. With your wash thinned, we next want to apply it across any brown, flesh and green areas of the model, pretty much the entirety of the miniature. Sepia wash is much more subtle and will not darken down those lighter colours as much as a black wash would. Once dried, you'll find that those small details will stand out much more than they did before. Perfect for smaller scale miniatures such as these. The next wash to apply is black wash, thinned in the same manner as before. This time we'll be applying it over just the German grey that we painted onto the weapons and the boots. Once the washes have been allowed to fully dry, we can begin our highlighting. This process requires using a slightly lighter paint than what we used to base coat, and the easiest way to create this is by mixing our base coat colours with some stone grey, like I'm doing here with some English uniform. The result is a slightly lighter version of our base colour that doesn't look too washed out, something that a pure white would have done. Using your mixture, you can then begin to lightly drag a fine tip brush over the raised edges and details of the area that we painted with the base coat colour over the jacket and the trousers in our case. By picking out these edges, we will help to enhance contrast and depth, resulting in a much more detailed finish. Following the same mixing process as before, apply a stone grey and Russian uniform mixture over any areas that we base coated with Russian uniform. For the scrim of the helmet, apply an edge of pure stone grey. Additionally, to give the boots a slightly reflective appearance, a thin line of stone grey painted across the toe works quite well. Using a mixture once again, apply a thin line of flat earth mixed with some stone grey over any wooden areas of your model, such as the rifle. To highlight the areas of exposed flesh, instead of a mixture, we'll be using some flat flesh. Use this paint to pick out the fingers and also some of the more prominent facial features like the cheekbones, nose and lips. The final highlighting step sees us using the metallic paint oily steel to create a dulled metallic appearance over the metal part of the rifle and any equipment that the infantryman may be carrying. By only giving the edge that metallic sheen we create a dulled but worn metal effect. And here we have the completed British infantry which were attached to their base before I added some textured paint and grass. 
For this tutorial, I took a lot of inspiration from the Colors of War book released to accompany Flames of War. It provides in-depth paint guides and covers an extensive range of World War II and Cold War era infantry and vehicles from multiple nations, eras and theatres. It's definitely worth checking out and is a great reference point for any modern history wargamer. You can find a full list of all the paints that I use in this tutorial in the description below, along with any other equipment that I've used to create this video. If you enjoyed this, please do let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe to be kept up to date with all of my latest videos. And so the only thing left to say is, thanks for watching and goodbye.